The Institute of Navigation is disseminating information to young people entering the profession. Without a solid foundation, advancements will forever be elusive, especially as older experts become unavailable. More and more of them are retiring every year. All can agree on the importance of fundamentals, so this short presentation will focus on the basics of two pervasive areas of navigation, with the presentation split into two parts, part one for inertial nav, and part two is satellite-based. A brief discussion can't be all-inclusive, so the high spots are emphasized. Round figures and idealizations, perfectly spheroidal Earth, circular GPS orbits with four times Earth radius, purely planar motion of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, are cited as factual with the understanding that available references show adjustments to account for departures. Also to save time, many equations are omitted even if central to the discussion. Further needs can be satisfied by investigating extensive tried and true documents. For thoroughness, some celestial concepts like orbits of GPS satellites or of the Earth are noted briefly. Viewers unaccustomed to that can skip it. If it distracts, ignore it. Likewise, those unfamiliar with Kalman filters can dismiss any thoughts of how update corrections are derived. In the limit, for example, unaided operation is free inertial navigation, that is, without corrections from GPS or other measurements. Beyond that free inertial case, valid corrections are there. Just understand that without worrying about details of how they're formed. A note in regard to popular terminology. Two kinds of updates. One is for correction based on new observed information. New estimate equals initial estimate plus computed correction. The other is a dynamic advance with time. The simplest example being new position equals old position plus velocity times time increment. Which one applies to any specific chart will be clear from context. Some of the slides used in this presentation were taken from very old publications of mine. They are used here because of their relevance to key concepts we will discuss. For this presentation, I exercised complete freedom in selection of content, formatting, and placement of all material. I draw heavily from two books I wrote, 1976 and 2007, not because they're the only references, but for notation and perspective consistent with this presentation. They are available from either of two websites. One of them is a Navtech GPS site. The other is jameslferrell.com, which also provides some printable conference papers, plus a number of one-page summaries of relevant topics. The number of those one-page summaries will eventually grow to over 100. A good way to begin is to describe something already familiar. Let's talk about vectors r, position, and v, velocity, for a point. Call it point C. In an inertial coordinate frame, we use subscripts 1, 2, 3 for components along unit vectors with directions i, j, k. Since those directions are inertial, subscript i, their derivatives are zero. They never change. Now in regard to the notation capital X1, capital X2, capital X3, instead of R1, R2, R3, for components of the boldface vector R. If that looks strange, I'll explain now that this has become standard. In fact, the components of boldface vector V are generally also called X, X4, X5, X6 in this example. That actually makes perfect sense as you delve deeper into these topics. In this coordinate frame, your intuition works perfectly. The second derivative of a position is the first derivative of a velocity, and it doesn't matter whether you differentiate vectors or their separate components, that is, differentiating them as three-by-one matrices. Enjoy that now, because that simplicity will go away as soon as we resolve vectors into components along axes that rotate. One more issue to mention. Total acceleration is expressed as a sum of the gravitational part, capital G, and the non-gravitational part, capital A. We do that because A, called specific force, force per unit mass, 
is all the accelerometer can detect. Drop one in a vacuum and it'll read zero. If your library has a copy of my 1976 book, the equation numbers are from that. Otherwise, you can ignore those numbers 1-16, 1-15. For an introductory description of inertial navigation, imagine three accelerometers sensing specific force along I, J, K on a plate that can rotate about one axis. A gyro senses the rotation and promptly sends a signal resulting in a drive command to counteract the rotation. So the plate remains inertially stabilized. Then the specific force is added vectorially to gravitation and that sum vector is integrated once to form velocity and again to form a position vector. Inertial navigation is generally carried out in a non-inertial frame. For example, with IJK reference direction subscripted by G, geographic, north, east, vertical. Note that the vertical direction slowly rotates as you move over the curved earth. North changes direction as you cross meridians. Remember Lindbergh, 1927, etc. With north chosen for the x-axis, the z-axis has to be down, not up, to make a right-hand frame. Again, that's a standard. Now the kinematics are a little more complicated. The north component of acceleration is not equal to the rate of change of north velocity. You may recall names like centripetal or Coriolis. There's not enough time to derive it all here, but the good news is it really isn't hard and you don't have to memorize. Simple and quick derivations, along with easy interpretation, are available from page 42 of my 1976 book and page 34 of my 2007 book. Here are the five coordinate frames most important to us. All of them have reference directions i, j, k with magnitude 1 with each one perpendicular to the other two. For the inertial frame we choose a z-axis along the Earth's polar axis and the x-axis along the equator's intersection with the Earth's orbital plane called the ecliptic. I sub i, j sub i, k sub i differs from the Earth frame only by a z-axis rotation through the hour angle of the vernal equinox. If the language sounds strange, don't let it bother you. That angle just rotates with the Earth, that's all. And it resets to zero every time the Greenwich meridian crosses that fixed line in space. From Earth to geographic coordinates, we go through latitude and longitude. Platform frame is what the onboard computer thinks the geographic frame is. And from there to vehicle coordinates, we go through heading, pitch, and roll angles. This is a little like the sketch shown a couple of slides earlier, but it's closer to reality in two important ways. Rotation can occur in all three dimensions, and the gyros now have connections at both ends. Their output signals still go to generate stabilization commands, which are now based on the difference between the absolute rates, that is with respect to inertial space, and what we call torquing rates. Those are the desired rotation rates, equal to the slow rotations mentioned earlier. Recall the Lindbergh meridian crossing example, and also the slow rotation of the vertical. For example, with one component having a magnitude equal to the north velocity divided by Earth radius. So now the gyros are used to keep the plate oriented along geographic rather than inertial axes. In the old days, those slow rate adjustments were maintained by torques proportional to them. The constant of proportionality was the gyro spinning wheel's angular momentum, denoted h. Today, strap-down mechanizations dominate by far. What we don't do mechanically, we make up for computationally. The nav computer takes care of reference frame rotation effects, Coriolis, centripetal, etc., mentioned earlier. Here's a slide that recaps some things that we saw before. The outcome is an algorithm for navigation in the geographic frame showing how to form velocity from accelerometer outputs with adjustments involving the Earth's rotation rate, omega subscript s, and latitude, and products of velocity components divided by Earth radius. This algorithm is applicable to both mechanically stabilized platforms and strap-down mechanizations.
The last slide described navigation in northeast down frame, and the slide before that described usage of gyros to maintain that geographic reference once those directions are established. Of course, that's important, but we also need to get pointed in the right direction in the first place. First, recall that the accelerometers don't sense gravitation. We provide that by making the necessary computations vectorially ourselves. If we're at rest, our computation will then offset the 1G upward from the accelerometers. I'll digress for just a moment to give a reminder that 1G upward is what counterbalances gravity to hold an object at steady altitude in cruising aircraft, lift force, or on a ship, buoyancy, or on land, restoring force. Any example with velocity constant or at zero. Now suppose our 1G computation was based on an imperfect perception of which way is down. Then there will be a small unwanted projection of indicated net acceleration in a horizontal direction. That causes our computed velocity to ramp up in that direction even though there's no motion. The slope of that ramp in each direction, north and east, is gravity multiplied by a tilt angle. So we repeatedly adjust the attitude, we untilt it, until the ramping goes away. That can get leveling correct to within a few tenths of a milliradian. Not perfect because accelerometer error can typically be a few tenths of a milli-g. The next task is to establish north direction. We'll talk right now about low enough latitudes away from the poles so that north has meaning. If magnetic heading is available, then after magnetic variation and deviation corrections, that'll provide a crude initial azimuth. To get the error lower, gyro compassing might be used. The basis of that is a known direction for the Earth's rotation rate. Think about it. It can't have a component about the east axis because by definition the equatorial plane, and therefore any plane parallel to it above or below the equator, is perpendicular to the Earth's polar axis. To form the east component, we take our angular rate vector from our gyros and transform it into the geographic coordinate frame. Look at the second component, northeast vertical, x, y, z. We make repeated azimuth adjustments to our computed direction cosine matrix until that component is zero. One last note, gyro compassing is a lot slower and less accurate than leveling the product of a small azimuth error in radians multiplied by that slow earth rate, maximum of only about 15 degree per hour at the equator, is hard to distinguish from gyro drift. With today's low cost gyros, forget it. We need some other way. For example, wait until we're moving and unless we're in a helicopter, we know that our velocity vector is mainly forward. That isn't precise either. Azimuth is never as accurate as leveling. Instead of yesteryear's gimbaled platforms, Straptown is taken over by storm. Instead of mechanically controlling the angular orientation of a plate, we let the inertial instruments rotate with the vehicle. And with the gyros promptly sensing every little rotation increment, we repeatedly recompute the attitude. That gets done at a fairly high rate, for example, 100 hertz, first in the form of an array of four parameters, and then by conversion of those four, to a 3x3 three three matrix of direction cosines used for coordinate transformation. Let me emphasize immediately, although the contents of the four parameter array can be called quaternion elements, you don't need to learn quaternion algebra or any new math. Think like a programmer. The four elements are changed into the coordinate transformation by cookbook expressions easily programmed. Very soon it will be shown how that transformation is used to process increments of translational velocity. Right now we're addressing rotational motion. For brevity, we'll omit the corrections printed in hot pink since they can be applied by fairly straightforward means. Rotation increments are then diminished by the nav reference frame's amount of rotation and the net result is used to advance the four parameter array dynamically. Since we know that its sum of squares must theoretically be one, we can occasionally divide each of those four parameters by the root sum square of all four. Once per second is easy and more than enough. Then all that's left is that cookbook conversion to the coordinate transformation matrix.
As soon as we generate it, we promptly use it. Take from the accelerometers the velocity increments occurring over the last delta time. Again, we don't need to dwell on the corrections printed in magenta. In strap-down mechanization, those increments are measured along vehicle axes, so we need to transform those into nav reference coordinates. Then we add two more effects occurring over the same delta time interval. One is gravity, and the other is a collection of terms at the right of slide number seven, which accounts for the way we're navigating in a non-inertial frame. Now it's time to say that I use summing over two consecutive intervals and why I do that. Recall that we get a velocity increment that accumulates while the vehicle can be rapidly rotating. That produces a degradation called sculling. Okay then, should we use the coordinate transformation at the beginning or at the end of that duration? What we really want is the one at the middle. One way to get that is to alternate translational and rotational incrementing in even and odd subinterval counts. When I did that, there was no further discernible degradation, even for flight in the presence of severe vibration. In a geographic reference frame, the classical way to get position from streaming history of velocity is vulnerable at high latitudes. The meaning of longitude and of cardinal directions becomes weaker near the North or South Pole. In the limit, the classical computation breaks down. No problem, we can handle easily by forming another direction cosine transformation, this time between nav reference axes and the Earth coordinate frame. That computation never breaks down. The matrix could be constructed from three angles, latitude, longitude, and an azimuth one called the wander angle. That last one can be initialized at zero if you start from a moderate latitude, and at that first setting, then, the matrix we want is computed from the angles. After that, though, it's the other way around. Recall that the nav reference frame slowly rotates. It's easy to understand, for example, a rate computed from a velocity component divided by a curvature radius, Earth radius plus altitude. North velocity uses a radius of curvature in the meridian, and east velocity uses a radius of curvature in the perpendicular direction. Those radii differ because the Earth is more like an ellipsoid of revolution than a sphere. I solve for that amount of difference and use it in maintaining the matrix computation. From that, you can always compute latitude. It can also provide longitude and wander angle except at polar positions and near a pole, those two angles aren't as well defined. Still, that's no problem. Those two angles aren't really essential near the poles. You could fly directly over the pole and always have a stable computation for everything you need, including horizontal position. To update vertical position, just add vertical velocity times time step. A long time ago, I was trying to learn what the Schuler effect was. The old literature would say, imagine a pendulum with length equal to Earth radius r. That really didn't help me. Let me suggest a simple picture with position error x. If we orient our diagram with our true position at the top of the circle, then when our estimated position is forward from there, note that our computed gravity vector will have a backward component. For a small angle, that component has magnitude of essentially g times x over r, and it's negative, opposite in direction from x. Then the acceleration error, second derivative of little x, is minus g over r times x. As college students, we learned that this produces a sinusoid with frequency equal to the square root of g over r radians per second. Plug in the numbers, and you'll get a period between 83 and 84 minutes. Let's take a look at the impact of that 84-minute Schuler period. Over the long term, a constant drift rate will produce a dominant error that grows like a negative-going sinusoid jacked up on a slanted line. For a path with constant velocity, the usual rule of thumb is one nautical mile per hour for each hundredth 
of a degree per hour drift. Gyros with low drift rates cost a lot. And with frequent updates available, they don't have to be that good. From van tests and flight tests conducted by Ohio University, I process data from gyros with many orders of magnitude higher drift. Note how that would scale up to enormous growth for a navigation error. It wasn't any problem, though, because nav error was never allowed to propagate for any appreciable duration. Even if a few minutes were allowed to elapse between updates, nav error wouldn't build up to those extremes. With GPS pseudo range, for example, updates keep knocking nav errors back down to a few meters. Most applications allow frequent GPS updates, so a crude IMU is acceptable. That opens up a ton of opportunities for getting state-of-the-art performance at low cost. That's the topic we address next. Right now I want to review some history to provide a clear perspective about the significance of using inertial nav over the short term. Once upon a time, many operational scenarios had to avoid dependence on external observations being available. That need still applies to a small fraction of applications today. But our goal is to cover the overwhelming majority of operations, not that small fraction. So we can plan for frequent available corrections, GPS or radar or other, where the designers of yesteryear could not afford to. They also had another handicap, those horse and buggy computers that were used a few decades ago. So they were inventive. Guys like John Bortz and others made strap-down work in the 1970s, despite limited state-of-the-art at that time. At typical computation rates for attitude and velocity, 100 hertz or a few hundred hertz, even an arithmetic multiply was too demanding at first. So, rotational and velocity increments were calibrated in negative integral powers of 2, and multiplication could be accomplished by a binary shift. Brilliant minds devised algorithms to minimize effects of round-off, truncation, coning, sculling, always with an eye toward the effect over the long term. The top of this slide shows some of the names associated with stunningly insightful developments regarding long-term error propagation. Now, here's some good news for almost all of us. I say almost because there are just a few who don't want to hear this. Those brilliant developments are not needed in the vast majority of today's systems. Earlier, I showed simple task lists for incrementing attitude, velocity, and position. That's all you need. They are validated by flight tests under severe vibration. The next slide describes some steps that have governed mechanization for years. They're no longer necessary because of technology improvements. Toward the end of this slide, I mentioned low cost. That was a promise, and only a promise, for a long time. I used to say the only place you could get a low-cost gyro was at a Greek restaurant. Finally, there are such things as low-cost gyros. One thing to watch out for, modeling inertial instrument errors as simple bias plus random components will work only for very short durations. That's especially true for low-cost but any strap-down IMU, even high-end, is sensitive to rotations, including vibrational ones. There's a lot to that topic. Motion-sensitive instrument errors are covered extensively in references. Many of the methods devised long ago continue to influence newer systems. While I've always expressed admiration for the resourcefulness of their developers, Avoidance of complexity is a stronger immediate motivation. My incrementing algorithms were flight validated without subdividing time into big and little and sometimes intermediate sized subintervals, without placing increments into different categories, without forming weighted sums and differences of their products, without separating gyro increments from nav frame rotation, rows of a matrix for one, columns of a matrix for the other, without requiring designers to be involved in the nitty-gritty of which term came from where, without elaborate adjustments for coning and sculling. 
Anyone who understands my task lists can purchase an IMU and put together a state-of-the-art system. What I just said holds even for the long term if you buy a high-end IMU. It's important to note that those task lists don't cut corners for incrementing attitude, velocity, and position. The short-term simplifications I make in many operations are forever propagation models governing Kalman filter updates with external observations. Elsewhere, I have documented more general statistical inertial error propagation models for long-term applications, but that broader topic isn't needed for most operations today. So, exploit today's capabilities for state-of-the-art performance even with computing tasks that are easy to understand. Again, with emphasis on applications where there's not much time between external fixes, with short-term dynamics, the task is still not trivial, but at least manageable. An immediate consequence of that can be identified by reviewing slide number seven. The adjustment terms that came from rotation of the nav reference frame have typical values no more than earth rotation rate times the speed, at most a few milli-g for subsonic aircraft. A couple milli-g's is a very significant amount, but the error in it isn't. The amount of error in computing terms of that magnitude would basically cause LSBs to buzz back and forth between one and zero, but the cumulative effect will be masked by random errors from other sources. That justifies omitting adjustment to those small terms. The external fixes are used to correct things of major interest, velocity, attitude, etc., without scrutinizing LSBs. Also, over the short term only, combined effects of all inertial error sources can be represented as slowly varying biases that also keep getting updated adaptively with every fix. I'll note right here that explains why it's permissible to omit tedious adjustments for things like coning error. Those effects show up as just another constituent of total drift. It doesn't matter whether a contributor to total drift came from the gyro or from inexactness in processing it. I can name a lot of error sources harder to trace than coning. Again, the corrections coming from fixes are adaptive, and that saves us. Otherwise, we'd have to have rigorous models for every contributor to total drift, and then we'd be in trouble because many of those are not pinned down by specs. For an error source that won't fit the slowly varying bias characterization, I'll instantly name this one, gyro cross-axis sensitivity due to imperfect mounting. The pitch gyro sensitive axis isn't quite perpendicular to the sensitive axis of the yaw gyro or the roll gyro, etc. Lab calibration reduces the misalignment effect, but maybe a tenth of a milliradian, one ten thousandth of a radian, could stay uncompensated. Then, during a level turn from north to east heading, the pitch gyro senses an unwanted attitude change approximately equal to one ten thousandth of 90 degrees. Actually, it's somewhat less, but for many operations, that's an unacceptable amount of change in verticality, the perception of which way is down. Mitigation of that effect definitely must not be overlooked, so I included it in my overall updating strategy. In just one slide, we can see the complete metamorphosis from raw gyro and accelerometer data into instantaneous attitude matrix plus position and velocity vector in the nav reference frame. Various optional operations are symbolized by switches. For example, inertial instrument calibration adjustments are performed if the coefficients are available. Other symbolic operations depicted here include multiplication by a scalar, vector cross product, accumulation, addition, subtraction, unit delay, normalization, dot product, etc. Numbers in rectangular boxes refer to equations in Chapter 3 of my 2007 book. As I mentioned earlier, if you understand this, you can purchase an IMU and build your own system. We need to understand loud and clear 
Inertial instrument errors are not limited to a bias and or white noise through a filter. Gyro outputs, for example, include a bunch of motion sensitive degradations. The chart you see right now is from a journal paper I wrote in the mid 60s. So the coefficient names in the rectangular boxes pertain to the old spinning wheel gyros. So never mind the names. But other gyro mechanizations are still governed by the dynamical laws of physics. There can still be errors that are G-sensitive, G-squared sensitive, angular rate sensitive, angular rate squared sensitive, angular acceleration sensitive, as well as imperfect scaling, cross-axis sensitivities, etc., etc. Furthermore, it isn't just the gyros. These issues affect the accelerometers as well. As if that weren't enough, they change with aging and thermal effects. Unfortunately, suppliers generally quote a loose indication, like a typical value instead of a firm spec commitment for some of those sensitivities. A lot of them, in fact, aren't in the spec at all. So where does that leave the designer who can't get firm numbers for the sensitivities and often not for the vibration spectrum either? Answer. It's crucially important to know when those issues do or don't limit achievable performance. We'll talk about that very briefly right now. A few slides ago we described how short-term operation can be maintained by external information that keeps knocking down propagated error effects before they can accumulate. But when you have to navigate from inertial data without GPS or any other external fixes, then you need to take into account the effects of motion-sensitive errors. That includes vibration modes too because they can change which affects the drift pattern. Obviously, there's a lot to this. All I have time for here is to note that vibration, both translational and rotational, needs to be taken into consideration. Vibration waveforms are made up of sines and cosines. A sine or cosine of 2 pi f t averages to zero, but the square of that sine or cosine doesn't. And you can recall that squared sensitivities were included in the overall set of error sources. Okay, that's enough gloom and doom. It's time to remind you about the silver lining. A properly designed Coleman filter can counteract the combined effects of these degradations. Properly designed means that you don't model unknown effects as slowly varying over too long a duration. Within the time constants chosen for your model, they can vary by some modest fraction of their range, but if they change radically, your model won't perform. One important reason for clarifying this issue is to caution against plans to rely on free inertial backup for extended durations. Unless you can allow errors to grow far beyond amounts that we've become accustomed to with GPS. That same mid-60s journal paper included this sketch showing how I simulated three gyro scale factor errors, epsilon, subscripted 1, 2, and 3, and additive errors denoted P, subscripted 1, 2, and 3, along with transfer functions, G of S, followed by quantizers and fed to a DDA, digital differential analyzer. That was the poor man's way of computing by shortcuts in those days binary shifts instead of multiplies as noted earlier. The DDA generated a computed direction cosine matrix C hat which was then compared versus the true direction cosine matrix C to produce time history of attitude error. What drives all these computations of course is the time history of roll pitch and yaw rates omega subscripted 1, 2, and 3 which again raises the subject of computing limitations back when this simulation was written. Numerically integrating for the true direction cosine matrix, C, would have taxed the old computers. So I used a closed form solution instead that restricted the types of rotations. I used a range of frequencies from zero on up for a sinusoidal angular rate vector about an axis fixed in vehicle coordinates. Of course, that didn't produce any coning motion, but pseudo-coning from this quantization was severe. Consider a roll gyro output of one quantization increment, immediately followed by a pitch gyro output of one increment. That indicates a 90-degree change in the vehicle's axis of rotation in a fraction of a millisecond. 
physically impossible, but that's what's reported because of the quantization. And finite rotations don't commute. For example, a pitch followed by a roll isn't the same as a roll followed by a pitch, even for small but finite increments. The non-commutativity effect builds up like a gyro drift. More important than results from specific simulation runs, I was able to derive analytical models for those error sources from imperfections in both gyros and computation, all of which were validated by the simulation results. Rather than telling readers to chase down 40-year-old journal papers, the models are included in my books. The deviation of a computed direction cosine matrix from truth just discussed can be expressed in terms of a vector denoted psi. I call it misorientation to distinguish it from misalignment, which is a mounting offset. Gyro mounting misalignment, for example, contributes toward the generation of total misorientation. Misorientation plays a central role in the propagation of inertial error. In slide number seven, we saw that rates of northeast and vertical velocity are made up of components of accelerometer specific force plus gravity plus adjustment terms. For short durations we can ignore imperfections in the adjustment terms so when we form the difference between true and computed V dot we get two ingredients. The first ingredient is the vector cross product of a psi with specific force which is easy to explain. Think about it. A 1g upward lift interacting with an unknown upward slant will induce error in a perpendicular direction. The computed forward velocity will include a false ramp. The second ingredient is the error denoted n in specific force itself. Actually it's common to generalize that to include an additional item. Uncertainty in the Earth's gravity vector. Little imperfections in gravitation for this lumpy bumpy planet. Under simplifying conditions, including constant drift rates, constant vector n, constant horizontal velocity, the last equation on the last slide gives a closed form solution for each vector component. The velocity and tilt errors are expressed with sines and cosines of the product W, T, where T is time and W is the Schuler rate defined in slide number 12. For short durations, less than a tenth of the Schuler period, the small angle approximations hold and we get a result that's largely intuitive. Integrating the east component of velocity error, we get eastward position error equal to its initial value plus east velocity error times t plus one-half t squared times total east initial acceleration error plus a cubic term from drift, which is the slow rate of change in the tilt error. Again, all this is documented in detail if you want to pursue it further. This slide is included for Kalman filter enthusiasts who want to see the dynamics expressed in a form suitable for estimation. For short-term durations, this is it. Longer durations are analyzed in the books, but that's the subject of another longer tutorial. The discussion for slide number 16 drew attention to error sources that take effect much faster than what we get from a Schuler cycle. I've always called these the Achilles heel of unaided strap down. In ancient times when dinosaurs roamed the earth and inertial instruments were mechanically stabilized, gyro mounting and scale factor imperfections were minor because they acted on slow rotation rates. Now their effects are essentially multiplied by angular excursions of the vehicle. For large angles, that's conservative, but not excessively pessimistic. In one publication, I showed that, even for 180 degrees, it predicts about one and a half times as much error, a factor of pi over two to be precise. Even without that approximation, with very respectable cross-axis errors down to 100 parts per million, here's an illustration of the effect after five cycles in a standard holding pattern. Cross-track error exceeds three-tenths of a nautical mile. In the real world, the roles of true and estimated path would be reversed. The true path would be the distorted one. For analysis, it was easier to do it the way shown here. In any case, 
This illustrates the error buildup for just one-tenth of a milliradian in each of two axes. If we had one milliradian, you would be amazed at how bad this would look. Moral of the story, thank God for corrections from GPS or other external update sources. Here's a simplified look at what updates can do. To make this easy, we'll look at just one direction. Suppose we had a speed measurement that we numerically integrate for position. Initially, the corrections for position and speed, denoted here by lowercase x1 and x2, would be zero. At any instant of time, the summation of products, speed times delta t, would produce estimated excursion capital X1. Combined with initialization, that would give a predicted value for position to be measured. Comparison versus an external observation would produce a residual. Note that the time history of these observations carries information about both position and speed. So, we multiply the residual by two different weighting factors, W1 and W2, to get corrections for both. I haven't explained how to get W1 and W2. That's another subject, also documented, but not covered by our scope here. Here's another example, again in just one direction, but with external observations in both position and velocity. In the lower segment, velocity increments are summed to produce V hat, which, after adjustment by any available correction, gives an anticipated value for the next external velocity measurement. I use parenthetical superscripts minus and plus to associate with the time immediately before and immediately after a discrete adjustment. So after a unit delay, the velocity residual is formed and weighed by W sub V to yield the velocity adjustment. The velocity at each instant of time multiplied by time increments feed the position segment, which works the same way as the lower segment. There's an obvious fundamental difference between this methodology and the preceding slide. Here we don't exploit the implication on dynamics offered by external position history. This method sacrifices some performance, but for the way I did GPS inertial integration, the sacrifice was negligible. What I gained was ability to use GPS carrier phase in a robust way that wasn't done before. I'll explain more about that later, near the end of this presentation. With this slide and the one following it, I bang on the same drum that's been beaten for years, even decades. Integrated system versus self-contained system. No contest. Every one of the advantages listed here can be provided by integration with interfaces that leave the system open to modification. A self-contained system can deliver the accuracy capability noted on the preceding slide. Beyond that, you inherit whatever limited performance comes from closed black boxes built by independent suppliers with no obligation to each other. In many cases, data resident in a box urgently needed by the system comes out delayed, often by an inaccurately known amount, transformed, often non-linearly or even subject to singularity, like a 90-degree pitch. It comes out filtered, often with an unknown transfer function. It comes out truncated, sometimes to a word length that violates error budgets for critical operations. And it comes out otherwise massaged by Kentucky windage or other inscrutable procedures. One of my favorite examples, attitude data from a gimballess IMU expressed in the forms of angles that would have existed if there were gimbals, and truncated to 16 bits. There goes the error budget for precision pointing. How do we get the required performance? By workarounds. There goes the budget and the schedule. Need to add a design feature later? Do everything all over again. Moral of the story, we need system integration worthy of the name. Reasons for the preceding slide. In the most general case, we need flexibility to add any or all of the functions listed here. Most of them cannot be accommodated by existing standard interfaces.
This concludes part one of the presentation. So far we've been emphasizing inertial navigation. With this slide we begin shifting more attention to GPS. I'll start with an oversimplified case of eastbound flight at constant cruise speed followed by an instantaneous turn northward. I chose the speeds in a contrived way to make longitude and then latitude crossings of one arc minute happen at the time of each GPS measurement. Pseudo ranges are simulated at six second intervals but with some data samples missing. Immediately that's much less than the usual reams of data used in flight. I did this to draw attention to what's achievable with little data. Satellites in view were cycled through with just one pseudo range measurement at most but not all six second epochs. Starting from 30 degrees north latitude and 90 degrees west longitude with the slow measurement scheduling six seconds between measurements of only one satellite just described. It takes about a minute to accumulate enough data to enable correction of both position and velocity by block processing. Then when the longitude is 89 degrees and 50 arc minutes each individual measurement was used to correct north and east position and velocity. When longitude reached 89 degrees and 35 arc minutes the direction instantly changed to north and speed was controlled to produce one arc minute latitude change every six seconds. If the position estimates had been perfect at all times, all of the little rectangular boxes would have been centered exactly at intersections of lines. The deviations you see were caused by 30 meter RMS simulated pseudo range errors. Velocities were also determined to within accuracies consistent with that amount of input measurement error and the length of time used to average the data. Since any amount of RMS error could have been simulated, performance details here don't have prime importance. Much more relevant to achievable performance, we'll see some real world flight test results later. Right now, I want to draw your attention to the way the corner turn was followed. Actually, I forced that by inserting just one discrete velocity vector queuing right when the turn happened. Another run made without that cue produced a predictable east overshoot followed by a recovery that started out very slow and very erratic. You can think of this as an introductory explanation of what the IMU does for us when we combine it with GPS. Independent of satellites, the IMU keeps track of the dynamics subject to occasional corrective adjustments from the external measurements. We need both. Inertial information without occasional corrections will veer off. GPS without aiding of dynamics won't follow rapid changes. For familiarity with the numbers involved with GPS, consider an oversimplified situation. Suppose we just need to determine aircraft altitude at an instant of time when a satellite happens to be directly overhead with no GPS error active at that instant. The GPS nav message enables us to calculate the 80 million number and a GPS measurement enables us to calculate the 59,970,000 number. Distance from Earth center to mean sea level is obtained by applying a database adjustment within a few meters to a number computed from an ellipsoid of revolution representation of the Earth. Unlike the mathematically simple ellipsoid, the adjustment accounts for Earth's lumpy bumpy irregularity. To within a few meters then, altitude would be computed from the simple arithmetic shown. It is simple, but for those unfamiliar, attention is drawn to the small difference of big numbers. Note how a slight one hundredth of one percent error in the GPS data would produce an insane result for altitude. With GPS we get used to computing small differences of big numbers. Now we'll graduate from one dimension to two. Suppose we know that we're at some fixed distance between 90 and 100 miles from Chicago. Then we can draw a circular arc in hot pink centered at Chicago with that distance as radius. 
If we're at a similar fixed distance from Milwaukee, then we can draw a circular arc, this time in chartreuse, with that distance as radius and centered at Milwaukee. Solution. We're in Rockford, where the chartreuse meets the hot pink. That was easy. Just one more thing to cover. The circles intersect in two places. We need another independent approximate clue to discard that other intersection point to the east. For example, if you know Greenwich Mean Time, local time will differ from that by one hour for every 15 degrees of longitude. Now we'll look at a two-dimensional problem in three dimensions. Suppose we know our altitude. Let's say we're on a ship. Then we're essentially at mean sea level. So our distance from each of two satellites can be formed by the Pythagorean theorem using differences of user and satellite x, y, and z coordinates. Then we can reverse the order of the subtraction and square the equations. The next step here is to re-express a squared equation forming components of a unit vector between the user and the satellite. Those elements denoted A are direction cosines. They're very nearly the same for locations close to an initial estimated position because the satellites are so far away. So we write two linear equations, one involving the true user position, capital X, Y, and Z, subscript U, and another involving estimated user position with departures denoted lowercase x, y, and z, subscript u. Subtraction gives us a linear equation for corrections to that initial estimated user position. If you're concerned about the influence of those corrections on variations in the direction cosines, those effects are almost always much smaller than the measurement error, and when that isn't the case, there are iterations and other well-known ways to take care of it. One more last note for this slide. The direction cosines here are expressed in ECEF, Earth-Centered, Earth-Fixed coordinates. The instantaneous satellite locations come to us in that reference frame, and it also offers maximum range of stable direction cosines we just covered. If our initial estimated position can be within a few miles, we can use the linear equation for corrections with everything expressed in geographic coordinates. Then the z-axis component is zero, and from the two satellite measurements, we have two equations and two unknowns. As teenagers, we learned how to solve that as shown. So, when indicated distances deviate from expectations by little r1 and little r2, this is how we compute corrections for horizontal coordinates, little x and little y. What we've just shown algebraically can be depicted graphically in a sketch with a flat earth approximation. In the most favorable case, two lines of position, LOPs, intersect at 90 degrees. Then the error in estimated coordinates will have magnitudes on the order of errors in the distance measurements. But when the lines intersect at a small angle, then a measurement error is effectively amplified by the geometry. That happens with a small determinant, giving small denominators in the equations of the preceding slide. With GPS, over and over you'll hear of GDOP, Geometric Dilution of Precision. This slide gives a plainer example of it. Minimum and maximum distances from a point on the Earth's surface to a GPS satellite can be approximated by drawing two concentric circles. For an orbital radius of four Earth radii, the minimum distance is three Earth radii. That's with a satellite directly overhead. You can see that the maximum in this sketch is the square root of 15. Now, instead of two intersecting lines or circular arcs, we'll intersect two spheres. Generally, they won't be the same size, and the plane of their intersection can have any old slanted orientation. But the important point is, we will know from two measurements that we're somewhere on a circumference of a known circle. If we add another measurement from a third satellite, note that we'll pierce that third one in two places with any reasonable geometry, will easily recognize which one to reject. Even if you never knew anything about how GPS works,
This idea of three spheres gives you a beginning explanation, but it isn't complete yet. We have to bring in time because the user's clock needs to be, in effect, brought into synchronism with the satellites. As usual, we start with a simplified example. This image depicts two synchronized transmitters that will send signals to a receiver located on the line between them at some distance x from the center. When the signal from the right transmitter reaches the receiver, the counter I put on the lower right will stop. Later, when the signal from the left transmitter reaches the receiver, the other counter will stop. If x had been placed at the center, both counters would end up with the same count. For easy explanation, let's consider the case where the signals are pulses of sound traveling at a thousand feet per second. Then if x had been only one thousand feet away from the center, one counter would increase by a second and the other would decrease by a second. For x anywhere between the transmitters, the difference between the counters would be two seconds for every one thousand feet away from the center. It's easy to see that the situation depicted here would produce a difference of 200 seconds. Sure enough, the clock difference after signal reception is 200 seconds, 3 minutes and 20 seconds. One more thing we can do here. Suppose the transmitters are synchronized with each other, but the receiver has a time base that's off by a second. Fortunately, we know the distance between the two transmitters. So, once again, as long as x is anywhere on the line between the transmitters, we're able to calculate where the sum of the counters should end up. It's just that total distance divided by the speed of the signal. In this example, instead of the 8-minute total we saw from the last slide, we're low by 2 seconds. Not 1 second, but 2. Both counters started off a second low. Sure enough, the clock difference after signal reception is the same 200 seconds and the total time is low by 2 seconds. Okay, it's time now to graduate from these examples to GPS. First of all, the signals now are electromagnetic, traveling at the speed of light, more like a billion feet per second instead of a thousand. No problem, we'll just count nanoseconds instead of seconds. Next. GPS transmitters are not stationary. Again, no problem. The satellite orbit parameters are transmitted by modulation added to the signal in space. From that, we can calculate where the satellite was at any time. Also, we acknowledge that GPS satellite transmitters aren't perfectly synchronized with each other. That's easy to solve because the modulation I just mentioned on each satellite's transmitted signal includes its clock adjustment information. Finally, of course, we need position in three dimensions, not one. We just showed that using an extra transmitter can give us the receiver clock correction. So we'll get signals from four satellites instead of three. But there's still an issue involving geometry. Well, before we started looking at this whole business about timing and counters, we saw how to navigate in two dimensions, and then we extended the basic idea to three. For the two-dimension case, we saw the need for geometric spread to avoid too much amplification of any measurement error. It won't come as any surprise, then, a few slides later, when you'll hear the same principle applies. Among the four SVs, space vehicles, synonymous with satellites, that we select, there must be enough difference in distance and direction. If not, then a small measurement error produces an inordinately large error in the navigation solution. To continue the discussion, those nanoseconds we count will conform to a reference time base that is among the data supplied by the nav message modulation. The time of the measurement will then be a number within a range of plus and minus 302400, 302,400, half of the number of seconds in a week. Each week starts and ends at midnight, Saturday night, Sunday morning. That enables us to relate range to pseudo range. You'll get the definition for that on this slide. We use units of time and distance. Each is easily converted to the other through multiplication or division by the speed of light.
First note that the distance we need to compute is the magnitude of the difference between two position vectors, satellite and receiver. The satellite position is expressed in the ECEF frame noted in slide number 8 of this part 2. But receiver position expresses more naturally in geographic coordinates. Also, notice that the measurement gives us not the instantaneous distance we want, but the time from satellite transmission to receiver reception. For GPS, that transit time is almost a tenth of a second. So here's how we can proceed. The nav message data enables us to compute the satellite position at the time of reception. We then transform receiver location from geographic coordinates into the ECEF frame, a standard operation. The magnitude of that vector difference divided by the speed of light is quite close to the transit time. So then we make an adjustment to get the satellite position at the time of transmission. Now we want to redo the vector subtraction using that satellite location. But the ECEF coordinate frame has rotated a little during the transit time, and vectors to be subtracted must be in the same coordinate frame. That's the reason for the earth rate correction omega subscript E cross R shown. The difference between this result and the measurement is very close to the residual denoted by little r in slides 8 and 9 of this part 2. But first, a few more corrections have to be taken into account. Immediately, let me offer reassurance. Don't let any words on the slide throw you. You don't have to become a physicist. I never dug into the derivations for relativistic, ionospheric, tropospheric terms. I just used the formulas cited from page numbers shown for Red Book Volume 1 available from the Institute of Navigation. So, beyond the outputs from these formulas, there's a bias in the receiver, for example, travel through the waveguide is not instantaneous. And finally, the net timing offset is the difference between satellite and receiver clock offsets, the latter being part of the overall solution as we've been discussing with the last few slides. After doing what the last slide showed for each of four SVs, we get a generalization of slide number nine of this part two. Four linearized equations in four unknowns to correct the receiver's clock time and its location in three dimensions. I use a different letter for these residuals because there are differences between measured and anticipated pseudo ranges, not ranges. Now that you've seen what happens to raw inertial and GPS measurements, this is a good time to identify a few more operations that may be required before putting things together. First, if your data comes in analog form, then when you digitize it, there's an obvious advantage to controlling the IU and receiver sampling from the same clock. Coordination of the hardware mechanization plan with the software code layout can produce an interface allowing achievement of required performance with natural data flow. If your IMU data and receiver data arrive already digitized with separate time bases, then you can do a computational synchronization. If you go that way, I recommend parabolic blending for high accuracy with low latency. You'll see that next. A book by Rogers and Adams derived a simple, general way to resample data. Take two samples before and two samples after every desired interpolation instant. Fit one parabola to the first three and another one to the last three points. The value at the desired instant is a weighted average between the two parabolas, with weights governed by closeness to the preceding and subsequent samples. For example, weigh by half and half when the desired instant is midway between. This picture looks better when it's printed compared to what you see with the lower screen resolution. It came from a van test gyro data time trace at 100 Hz used as the input shown in the middle plot. I computed two output time traces 
for a faster and a slower data rate chosen as prime numbers. Performance was actually better than these plots show because, for expediency, the abscissa values were constrained to integers. That caused a slight shift in the output time histories. The message in any case is that parabolic blending works. This slide intentionally conveys only a very general broad brush impression so that only the amount of data on each line and the number of lines needs to be visualized. No importance at all is attached to specific data values or symbols, only data flow and format. The front of my data file contains one set of nav message data for each satellite used during the flight. Every data record following that is either an IMU record at 100 Hz or a GPS record for each SV, each second providing one record for pseudo range and one for carrier phase. The IMU data records consist of single character for record type plus two integers I didn't use. Temperature compensation wasn't active in the flight tests I describe here. Plus six words for inertial instrument data. 3 gyro, 3 accelerometer. Each GPS record contained a single character for its record type plus satellite identification and timing information plus, finally, the pseudo range or carrier phase measurement. That's the form I requested for all the data I received for van and flight testing and it enabled me to program it in a very straightforward way. This depicts the layout of my program. It does the things described in the preceding slides, and in many ways, it resembles approaches taken by others, but with some major differences. The biggest departure from other approaches lies in differencing and segmentation. Using differences of satellite measurements instead of the measurements themselves eliminates the receiver clock adjustment by cancellation. That's a common procedure. But for carrier phase, I use only the sequential change over each one second period. Furthermore, I separate position from dynamics. Position correction uses no carrier phase data and no pseudo ranges are used for dynamics. The dynamics segment supplies streaming velocity which is integrated into position and the pseudo ranges close a loop around that to counteract any tendency to veer away. Actually, I use about a half dozen departures from custom, but I wanted to highlight the ones just noted. Here's a sample drawn from more than 3,000 from flight test showing the accuracy of one second sequential change in carrier phase. From the preceding slide, remember the differences of satellite measurements instead of the measurements themselves. Well, I chose one high elevation satellite to be used as a subtraction reference. The column at the extreme left gives the measured sequential change in the difference between two satellite carrier phases. For the rest of the columns, in order from left to right, components are resolved along SV sightline directions using the vectors denoted H to show effects of how far each satellite moved, how far the reference satellite moved, how far the Earth geographic coordinate reference frame moved due to rotation, how far the vehicle's estimated geographic velocity carried it relative to the spinning Earth, and finally, the residual. That estimated velocity clearly has accuracy on the order of a centimeter per second. If it didn't, we wouldn't be seeing centimeter residuals for six one-second difference measurements. I divided the flight history into ten periods of about seven minutes each with a minute of overlap at each end. For each period, I put results into plots like these. Below the top section, showing applicable conditions, the first plot on the left gives the ground track. You can see the turn late in this period. Next to that is a pair of plots with ground speed in meters per second, that's the blue curve, beneath altitude, the brown colored plot, in decameters, for convenience in plotting with the same scale numbers. When altitude holds nearly constant as a crosswind transitions into a tailwind due to a turn, the speed increases 
More plots documented in the book include turns into a headwind, causing the ground speed to decrease. The graph on the upper right contains five plots. There's a roll angle in red, pitch angle in green, drift angle in magenta. That's the azimuth deviation of horizontal velocity direction off the heading. And there are two plots hugging the abscissa. Those are the tilt corrections off the two horizontal coordinate reference lines. In this plot, the yellow one is swapped out by the blue one, but on an enlarged scale, they show up with RMS values on the order of three-tenths of a milliradian. That's state-of-the-art performance. The magenta plot shows how heading starts coming closer to velocity direction as the crosswind transitions into a tailwind toward the end of the plot because of the turn. The other two plots show residuals for the pseudo range and carrier phase differences. The former are good to within a meter RMS and the latter give further testimony to RMS velocity accuracies on the order of a centimeter per second. All of the flight periods at this altitude, about three quarters of a mile up, produce this same level of performance. All this time we've been concerned with navigation, our own position and dynamics. Before closing, I want to draw attention to tracking and surveillance, position and velocity of other vehicles relative to us. There's a golden opportunity to advance tracking performance just by comparing observed pseudo ranges among participants. Each one could track all the others. Give each one an assigned transmit time slot and there's no garble, vastly superior to the interrogation and response where one participant's signal is everyone else's interference. Performance would also get a major boost. Consider our own receiver at point O and two tracked objects at positions labeled X. Start with the easy one first. Suppose a faraway satellite lies exactly along an extension of the line from our receiver to a tracked object straight ahead. Then his distance away from us is just the difference between his sort of range and ours. The big errors are largely canceled out except for our receiver clock offsets. But we've already seen how to cancel those by using differences of two satellite measurements. All we need to do now is extend the example to different directions. But that's already been shown with direction cosines in earlier slides. More important, the entire procedure for comparing measurements between satellites and between receivers is firmly established by decades of success. The only fundamental difference between that differential GPS and this proposed tracking is that with motion allowed for every participant, nobody is stationary, everything is relative. That's actually fortunate. Relative position and relative velocity is just what we need for tracking. If you want to track objects total velocity, just add your own velocity vector to the relative velocity. Easy. Also note that tracking accuracy is essentially unaffected by navigation error. The land mass in the figure can be shifted forward or laterally by horizontal position error, enlarged by an altitude error, rotated by a heading error, or distorted by a leveling error. None of that will affect the relative position of the X's with respect to the O's. So. Both navigation and tracking are within scope here. Well, here we are. I hope this has been useful to you. Most of this was just introductory material, but I did insert a few advanced concepts. The opportunity to disseminate this was, of course, provided by the Institute of Navigation. So, as a member, I want to thank ION for the opportunity and specifically Larry Lyons for putting the audio and video together. And as a Christian believer, I want to thank God for enabling me to do this. As a tutorial instructor, I hope that whatever use is made of this will be beneficial. If you're new to all this and these steps seem complicated, going over them a few times should give you a helpful start before tackling journals and books on these topics. So long and God bless.